Barbara Brown Taylor tells a story about a church celebrating Pentecost with a birthday party. Suddenly Jesus showed up and after the shock of seeing him in the fellowship hall, they asked if he would cut the cake. Delighted, said Jesus. Whose birthday is it, anyway? It's ours, somebody said. We're celebrating the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost, Jesus said, licking off his thumb. When was that? You know, the one Luke wrote about. Jesus looked up at the ceiling like he was counting. Actually, that would have been my 21st Pentecost if I'd made it, he said. And seeing their puzzled faces, he said, Hmm, you did know, didn't you, that Pentecost is a Jewish holiday? See, that's what all my friends were doing in Jerusalem in the first place. They were there for, for Shavuot, the f festival of weeks, one of the three great pilgrim festivals of the Jewish year. I hope you're smarter than me. I didn't know that Pentecost existed long before the story in Acts 2, or that it was a Jewish festival. Shavuot is the festival of weeks that occurs seven weeks after, after um, Passover. It's when the first fruits of the harvest were brought to the temple. Traditionally, it also commemorates God's giving of the Ten Commandments to the people on Mount Sinai. This is the occasion God chose to send the Holy Spirit to a group of disciples meeting in Jerusalem. The book of Acts is the story of the church's beginning and how Christianity spread after the death and resurrection of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus' disciples at Pentecost, thousands believed and were added to the church. And the rest of the book highlights the ministries of Peter and Paul. The drama of the Pe Pentecost was over the top with sounds and light effects. A violent wind, tongues lighting on the head of everyone, disciples speaking to others in languages they had never spoken. It was scary and holy at the same time. The Acts 2 story highlights communication, community, courage, and clarity. I borrowed this idea from a writer who uh, decided to stay anonymous. First of all is community. Pentecost was a communal, communal experience. On the day of Pentecost, the followers of Jesus were all in one place. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Religious communities have a long history of drawing people together, and something precious is lost when people choose to practice their faith in isolation, if it can even be done. Communication. When the Spirit came, the apostles started speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. That's verse 4. This amazed the visitors in Jerusalem because the apostles were Galileans and the Galileans weren't known for their foreign language ability. The Spirit's gift of communication enabled them to tell the story of Jesus in a clear and compelling way. There was courage. Some of the residents in Jerusalem sneered at the apostles and said, look at them, they're drunk. Peter stood up courageously and said, we are not drunk. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a fulfillment of the ancient prophecy. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is Peter, who just weeks before was not courageous enough to admit that he knew Jesus. There was clarity. When Peter spoke to the crowd, he clarified a passage from Joel that had been a mystery before, confusing, but now it made perfect sense. Peter wanted them to know that salvation is, not, is no longer just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles too. It's a surprising twist in the biblical story that we are now all God's people. 
There you have it. The wind of the spirit creates community that communicates with courage and clarity. We celebrate Pentecost with bright colors and waving of the scarves, but I read that some churches celebrate Pentecost with a kite uh, flying contest. The loft of the wind picks up the kite and takes it sailing off into the sky. Jesus taught Nicodemus that the spirit is a mysterious, unseen force. You can hear the wind, but you can't see it. We can't program or control the Holy Spirit. She blows where she will. She comes like a soft whisper, or she can come like a hurricane. One thing I hate about windy days is that it messes up my hair. When the, spirit of the, the wind of the Spirit blows, things can get messy and chaotic too. Wind plays a big part in the uh, Pentecost story for a reason. Some translations refer to the violent wind of Pentecost as a holy hurricane. That isn't so different from the Greek and Hebrew words for spirit. In Greek, the term is hagios pneuma, holy wind. How about if we prayed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Wind? The Spirit is referred to as she in Aramaic and Hebrew because the word ruach or wind or breath is a feminine gender. In fact, in early Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic circles, the Spirit had a name, Sophia, meaning wisdom. In Greek, however, the term spirit is neuter gender and therefore is return, re referred to as it. And I probably didn't go through my sermon. I probably refer to him as he, so we, he's everything. While it's common for us to portray the spirit as a dove, the ancient Celts understood the spirit to be a wild goose. The dove creates a peaceful, calm image, a goose can be a noisy, bothersome bird. But the image of the wild goose shakes us out of our complacency. It certainly moderates our idea of a safe, sweet spirit. Many years ago at Elkhart City, Carrie and I directed the children's choir. Back when Wendy Knopfsiger and Vanessa DePew and Christopher Kelsey and Brian Vance were little. One of my favorite songs was God is Like a Rock uh, by Natalie Sleeth. And I don't know, Angie, if you used that song or not. It has a verse that says, God is like the wind, something no one sees, mighty as the gale, gentle as the breeze, with a hidden power no one can deny as the days go by. Francis Beaufort a rear ad admiral in the Navy developed a method for describing the wind. These are his definitions. There's a calm atmosphere when the sea is like a mirror, smooth as glass. There are moderate, light, moderate, and strong winds which increase from wavelets to small waves to large waves with white foam crests and light sp spray. There's the gale that creates moderately high waves and crests that break into sea spray. There's storm, which produces very high waves with long overhanging crests. The sea surface has a white appearance with a tumbling effect. And then there's the hurricane that fills the air with foam and the sea is completely white with, dri white with driving spray. If we could use a similar scale to measure the wind of the spirit, it might look like this. The calm atmosphere is a condition where we experience the spirit leading us, equipping us, and giving us serenity and peace. Peace be with you, Jesus said to the disciples after the resurrection. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, this calm, is something we can feel even though our lives are buffeted by hurricane force winds. There's the strong breeze. The spirit has a creative power, the spirit wind has a creative 
power to it as the creation when the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, when we head into a situation where we face new direction, fresh opportunities and unlimited possibilities, we look to the Spirit for wisdom and power. Then there's the gale. Higher up the scale, a force that breaks unhealthy patterns and shakes up the status quo. This is a powerful wind, one that can knock us off balance, out of our comfort zones. And then there's the hurricane at the top of the chart. This is what hit Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, turning the lives of the apostles completely upside down. They were reoriented and changed from fearful disciples to fearless evangelists. And they headed off to the mission field to share the power of and sense of pur purpose that God gives. We call this revival. When hurricane force spirit winds blow across the landscape of our souls and our common life together, nothing will ever be the same. James Harnish tells of an English bishop who visited a sleepy little parish along the River Thames. The village priest was discouraged and depressed, feeling like he wasn't accomplishing very much. And finally he confessed to the bishop, I can't say that we're setting the Thames on fire. And the bishop replied, young man, I'm not nearly as concerned about setting the Thames on fire. What I want to know is, if I take you out and drop you in, will you sizzle? I can't say I've experienced uh, God as a storm or a hurricane like some people have. For me, the Spirit prods me to do or say something when I would rather hang back and be quiet. The Spirit nudges me to be quiet when I would rather give somebody a piece of my mind. I am given courage to take risks or move out of my comfort zone to contact someone or to make a phone call. When I'm frightened, the Spirit brings calm. You can add your own descriptions to the list. If we are truly living in the Spirit, our faith is authentic. Wesley Taylor illustrates the difference with this comical story. It was Pentecost, it was Pentecost Sunday, and as the congregation filled the church, the ushers handed all of them a red carnation. The people listened atten attentively as the reading of the Pentecost story was read how the disciples had heard what sounded like a powerful wind from heaven and when the Holy Spirit came it was like tongues of fire and then came the sermon the Spirit of the Lord is upon us the preacher began like a powerful wind from heaven shouted a woman sitting in the front pew and then she threw one of her, car her red carnations to the altar the preacher began again the Spirit of the Lord is with us, like tongues of fire, like tongues of fire, she said, and threw another red carnation up front. The preacher looked straight at the woman and said, now throw your pocketbook. <laughs> to which the woman replied with conviction, preacher, you just done calmed the wind and put out the fire. <laughs> we have to put our money where our mouth is. Diane shared the right idea this morning. Words of faith are good, but they're only authentic when they affect how we behave. The acid test of the Spirit is how we live out the fruit of, the, of love, joy, patient, peace, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, humility, self-control, and faith. To bear spirit fruit we need to be connected to the spirit vine, our life source and our power source. Amen.